Ladies and gentle soars, Mesozoic maniacs, and dinosaur dorks, welcome to Assessing Survival, the series where we take animals, people, and fictional biological beings, placing them in different environments throughout history, as well as some forms of fiction. Today, we pose the question, could grizzly bears survive in the Mesozoic era? Now, before we transport the grizzly bear into the Mesozoic, let's determine which period would be most suitable for them. The Triassic period. The Triassic would definitely offer grizzly bears the easiest time in terms of competition, as most land animals did not get much bigger than animals we have today. The grizzly bear could pretty easily become pretty high up on the food chain in the Triassic, only really being outmatched by Pseudosuchians like Fasolus However, Triassic period was simply too hot for a furry animal like the grizzly bear to thrive in. Global temperatures averaged between 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. The Jurassic period. The Jurassic would be the best in terms of climate for the grizzly bear. With an average of 62 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16.5 degrees Celsius, the Jurassic was only a bit warmer than today. Competition for bears in the Jurassic is less than ideal, but they could still find a middle of the food chain niche and perhaps do better in that niche than its reptilian counterparts. The Cretaceous would be ideal for grizzly bears in terms of food, particularly the end of the Cretaceous is when we start to see things like fruits, nuts, flowers, bees and honey, and grasses to start to appear. Though the Cretaceous was quite a bit warmer than the Jurassic due to higher volcanic activity, averaging about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius globally. Though not impossible for the bear to survive in, certainly not ideal. In terms of competition, the Cretaceous is probably where the grizzly bear is worst off. Theropods like Tyrannosaurs and Carcharodontosaurids were larger than their Jurassic forerunners. I believe that the Jurassic period would be ideal for the grizzly bear to survive in, mainly due to the climate, as well as their competition being slightly easier to deal with in the Jurassic than in the Cretaceous. We're going to place a breeding population of Kodiak grizzly bears in North America 155 to 145 million years ago. I've chosen specifically the Kodiak bear because of its size, which, spoiler alert, it will need every last ounce of. We'll be using animals found in the Morrison Formation as a reference for their interactions with dinosaurs. I will be using five different categories to score the bears on their ability to survive. These categories are environment suitability, advantages, disadvantages, food source, and competition. These scores will then be added up for a final survival assessment score. Let's start with environment suitability. Bears are generalist animals, meaning they're pretty adaptable to any environment you place them in. The temperatures the grizzly bear will be living in are more or less the same temperatures that they experience in the summer today, except all year round. Temperatures in the Jurassic were pretty uniform globally, only changing slightly with altitude. No ice caps means not nearly as much snow as there is today. Bears that live closer to the poles may still hibernate, but will more often simply enter torpor, which is a state that both black and brown bears enter in mild winters. A lack of deeper winters, at least where we'll be placing them in the need to hibernate, means bears don't need to fatten up as much as they do in our modern era. This could potentially mean that our bears will be smaller on average since they don't need to eat as much every year. However, hibernation is also when most grizzly bears give birth. A good portion of the time a cub spends in the safety of a bear's den would now be spent out in the open, meaning mother grizzlies will have to work extra hard to protect their cubs. Historically, grizzly bears have a range as far north as Alaska and as far south as Sinaloa. So generally, grizzlies can adapt to most of the climates they'll be exposed to in the Jurassic. Environment suitability, four out of five. Now for advantages. Bears are very smart. Although they only have an EQ of 0.8 to 1, their brains are incredibly complex. Their intelligence is often compared to that of higher primates, which is definitely saying something about how smart they really are. Intimidation. Bears are great at making themselves seem like a much more dangerous threat than they are. When a bear means to threaten another animal, they will stand up on their hind legs, doubling their height. This, combined with growling, makes them incredibly intimidating. Imagine you're a Ceratosaurus, and you come across a grizzly bear. At first you're like, all right, easy meal, let's go. And then suddenly it is now eye level or maybe even taller than you and is making these noises. Whoa, 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 what the hell is this? And you call it a day. I imagine the grizzly bear being kind of like a honey badger in the Jurassic. Like I mentioned in the suitability scoring, bears are a jack of all trade animal and generally are seen in all terrestrial habitats jungles, mountains, deserts, forests, etc. They will have zero issues getting comfortable in their environment, especially given time to evolve and adapt. This, combined with their generalist lifestyle, squashes any doubt that they can indeed adapt. Another thing I'd like to mention is that despite their size, 
Brown bears are still very adept climbers. This will make getting away from large theropods a breeze. Maturation. Grizzly bears, as big as they are, only take four years to reach sexual maturity, continuing to grow until they're seven to ten years old. Allosaurus likely attained its full size around 15 years. This means that our brown bears will reach maturity as fast or faster than their competition, which will be very important for establishing a population. Advantages, 5 out of 5. Disadvantages. Although grizzlies are top dogs in their environment today, this will simply no longer be the case in the Jurassic. They can no longer occupy the role of the bully. This will affect almost everything about their lifestyle. No longer can they occupy a large open field and battle for the right to mate without risking being picked off by predators like Allosaurus. The same goes for fishing. We've all seen videos of bears sitting by the river, catching fish. This would also become much more dangerous for the same reasons. No longer can they walk through the forest in confidence, but rather in constant awareness and fear. Their lifestyle will have to change significantly if they are to survive. Normally, grizzly bears are just fine living a solitary lifestyle, because like I mentioned before, nothing wants to mess with them. No more. The Kodiak bear will likely have to adopt a lifestyle that is far more shy and secluded. Disadvantages, 2 out of 5. Food Source Though the Jurassic is devoid of many of the fruits and plants that bears feed on today, they'll be perfectly fine adapting to a higher protein-based diet. We don't really think of them this way, but grizzlies are really just walking garbage disposals. They'll eat anything. I don't see them having any problem foraging and discovering new, easy food sources. But what about their prey items? The Jurassic is known for big, impressive herbivores. No doubt, a grizzly bear has no business going for any sauropod. But out of the prey animals in the Morrison Formation, I honestly think that all but two are on the menu for the bear. Ornitholestes, Frutidens, Drinker, Dryosaurus and Ophneliosaurus are all herbivores that are small and fair game for our grizzly bear, so we can reasonably cross these off the list. There's also two small carnivores, Solurus and Tanicolegrius. These are also easy meals for a grizzly bear. These smaller dinosaurs would be the preferred prey of our bears. Camptosaurus would also have been a decent meal, comparable to that of an elk or a young moose. Though very similar to its relative the Iguanodon, Camptosaurus lacked the distinctive thumb spike that would come in real handy. Shut your f***ing mouth. I am sick of your shit. As for armored dinosaurs, Mimora Pelta and Gargoylosaurus are likely to be a challenge for grizzly bears to take down. Stegosaurus and Hesperosaurus are out of the question. Their size combined with their thagomizers make it far too dangerous to take them on. Bears also indulge in opportunistic scavenging. I can easily see a grizzly bear moving in on a corpse after an Allosaurus or Torvosaurus has had its fill. Food source, 4 out of 5. And now for competition. Bears will be competing with carnivorous theropods, which are far better adapted for their environment and hunting their prey. There are two theropods in the Morrison Formation that occupy the niche our bears are going for, and two that grizzlies will surely have to avoid. These theropods are Ceratosaurus and Marshosaurus, as well as Allosaurus and Torvosaurus. Marshosaurus, the smaller of the two, is longer and slightly taller than a grizzly bear at the hips. However, the upper end of weight estimates only put Marshosaurus at roughly 4 to 500 pounds, as opposed to Kodiak and coastal brown bears, who often reach over a thousand pounds in weight. Even female grizzly bears will reach about six to eight hundred pounds. The competition between these two animals wouldn't be too dissimilar from the competition between grizzlies and black bears today. They'll compete for the same food, but the grizzly bear will likely be able to scare off or even kill Marchosaurus. Ceratosaurus, both heavier and visibly larger than the grizzly bear, will be tough competition. Ceratosaurus weighed about 20 to 2200 pounds. Grizzly bears at their absolute largest reach about 1400 pounds. Adolescent Ceratosaurus, will likely be regular competition for our bears. However, adults will surely be avoided. Like adult Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus and Torvosaurus will be avoided at all costs. These two theropods are simply far too large for grizzlies to even consider dealing with. We don't know how dinosaurs would react to intimidation attempts from a grizzly, so maybe in some rare cases, a bear can be tall and loud enough to scare off larger predators. Chances are, however, they'd simply be easy snacks for these larger theropods. Competition, 2.5 out of 5. Our final assessment score for the grizzly bear in the Jurassic period is 6.5 out of 10. It's very likely that bears can survive in the late Jurassic, just not in the same niche they occupy today. There's going to be a lot of adjustment for our bears, and adapting to find a better niche for themselves will be a necessity. A bear necessity. Bear necessities, the simple bear necessity. Now that we know a grizzly bear can at least survive in the Jurassic, let's talk about some ways the brown bear could evolve in order to better fit their environment. Bears as we recognize them only evolved in the past 20 million years. In the Mesozoic, they would have at least all the way up until the KT extinction to evolve. I personally see bears going one or all three of the following ways. Taking to the trees. Ursus canopius aka the canopy bear. Grizzly bears, although not as good at it as black bears, are capable climbers. We have limited knowledge of arboreal dinosaurs, especially in the Jurassic. This means that the niche of a large arboreal predator 
would be, as far as we know, wide open. Over the next 4 million years, our brown bear evolves to occupy this niche. Ursus canopeus resembles a mix of a black bear and a jaguar, sporting a long tail to better traverse the canopy and a patterned coat to blend in with its forest environment. The canopy bear is adept at preying upon other arboreal animals, but is also very well adapted for leaping down from the treetops onto unsuspecting prey. A drop bear, if you will. <laughs> Scavenger specialization. Ursus putridus, aka the rotten bear. Bears, already moving garbage disposals, could maybe choose to dive deeper into this niche. Literally and figuratively. Even an Allosaurus probably couldn't fit a whole Diplodocus in its stomach. Surely there are plenty of leftovers. Ursus putridus will specialize in eating the rotting meat of large dinosaurs, and will become much larger in order to scare off other scavengers. Ursus putridus regularly even crawl inside the corpses of large sauropods, and will gorge themselves for as long as the corpse provides them shelter. These bears resemble a larger but stubbier looking polar bear, with black fur and a bare red face like a vulture. The rotten bear is incredibly fat, year-round. They live to feed, but don't underestimate them, they are nearly 11 feet tall on their hind legs and reach up to 2,200 pounds. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Ursus grandius, aka the Great Bear. Generalist animals like grizzlies are the best survivors in the animal kingdom when it comes to rapid changes in the environment. The problem with specialization is that once the ecosystem is disrupted, specialized animals cannot adapt. It's likely in the bear's best interest to maintain this lifestyle. But if they're going to do this, they have to become much larger. Enter Ursus Grandius, the Great Bear. In just one million years, this bear has evolved to maintain its generalist lifestyle, but in a world of dinosaurs. The largest known mammalian predator on land we know of is Andrusarchus. Our Great Bear is about one and a half times the size of Andrusarchus. Ursus Grandius has evolved a longer torso and stronger limbs that allow it to stand even taller than its predecessors. Roughly six and a half feet at the shoulder and up to 13 feet on its hind legs. The Great Bear weighs on average 3,200 pounds, depending on sex and time of year. Much higher on the food chain than before, great bears are able to do battle with dinosaurs like Ceratosaurus and come out on top. In fact, our bear has evolved a much stronger skull and long, sturdy canines evolved for piercing the windpipes of large dinosaurs. Its powerful forelimbs and impressive claws allow it to grapple and wrestle animals to the ground and execute them, just as they would with a moose or elk today. Though Allosaurus and Torvosaurus remain much larger than the Great Bear, interactions between the two are no longer one-sided. When standing on its hind legs and vocalizing, the bear becomes very intimidating to these predators. Most often, these large theropods will sooner back off before risking a battle with Ursus Grandius. Allos Allosaurus had never seen such bullshit before. But if they don't, the bear is more than capable of fending them off. The great bear is also a burrower. Great bear burrows are massive mounds of dirt, leaves, bones, and anything they can find, really. These dens go as far down as 12 feet into the ground and have a chamber where their cubs remain for much of their early lives, increasing their chances of reaching adulthood. Another trait our bears have adapted is loose herding. Loose herding is a new type of social behavior that allows our bears to live their mostly solitary lifestyles, but gain from the safety and numbers at the same time. Great bears tend to live within at least two square miles of other great bears. When in danger, one great bear can call for the help of another great bear greatly increasing the average lifespan and survivability of the bears. During the mating season, hundreds of great bears will amass in one area, and the dinosaurs know to stay away. Even with all these adaptations, our bear is still a generalist, walking garbage disposal. It will eat just about anything in its Jurassic environment, just as it would today. Because of this, the great bear and its descendants continue to be relevant in trophic systems throughout the Mesozoic. The presence of these animals will dramatically affect the evolution of dinosaurs surrounding them, perhaps seeing an entirely different ecology than we see in the Cretaceous. Descendants of the Ursus Grandius will go on to survive the KT extinction, along with their early mammalian cousins, also creating an entirely new ecosystem going forward, paradoxically creating a world where bears as we know them today wouldn't exist. Or humans. But if there's no humans, that means there's no one to complain about my opinions. Spinosaurus sucks, T-Rex on top, baby, let's go! Woo! If you liked the video and have a good idea for the next Assessing Survival episode, leave a comment and I'll put it to a vote in the community tab on my channel. Also, let me know if you guys like the addition of the speculative evolution section. Like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.